Okay, so um, thank you very much to um, the organizers and thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Uh, so uh, my name is Donnick O'Connell from the University of Fribourg and this is a joint work um, in collaboration with Tumas and Christina Conroy at uh, Moorhead State University. Unfortunately, Christina can't join us, so it's just going to be myself and Tumas. I'm going to present the first um, roughly half of the paper, the first three sections, and Tumas will take it home. So Tumas, do you want to go to the next slide? Okay, so just a very general point before we start concerning the scope of this paper. And I think it's important to say that what we're doing is we are responding to a problem that's out there in the literature, which, which I'm going to describe um, briefly in the first section. And we're going to introduce a new approach to this problem. So structurally, what we're doing is quite similar to what Matteo is doing in his paper, although, as you'll see, there are some differences, differences between what we would propose and what he was proposing. But it's important to note that we are not giving a comprehensive assessment of our approach compared to other possible approaches. And also we have not provided a systematic or detailed account of how our approach works in relation to um, specific issues in quantum mechanics. So it's important to note therefore that the, the scope of what we're doing in this paper is, is quite limited and, and it does suggest further um, work further down the line. But what we want to do is to put this approach on the table and at least show that it's, it's, um, it has some initial plausibility and initial coherence. So next slide, please. So our starting point is this um, well-known idea, the, the non-supervenience of quantum systems. So I'm going to go through the first section in particular quite quickly. And of course, we can always, um, if there's questions, you can always raise them afterwards. Um, but I'm assuming that, um, that we're all familiar with the basic idea of the non-supervenience of quantum systems. And this has prompted a number of different uh, ways of accounting for um, the metaphysics of this um, fact. And these include relational holism of various sorts and there's also non-relational holisms. So this is similar to the, the type of distinction that Matteo outlined in his talk, Rust and, and Monist views. And so we want to talk a little bit about the Monist alternative and in particular we're going to talk about the, the same paper, the Chaffer paper that Matteo mentioned. So the thought here is that if we, if we have the idea of entangled particles, and I, I appreciate that maybe the word particles is a bit loaded, but um, I'm, we're just going to use that um, terminology um, for the purposes of presentation at least. So if we have a system with entangled particles, and, let's, and our toy example will be two electrons in the singlet state with opposite directions of spin. And one of the points that Isman and Schaefer really stress is the idea that entangled particles are modally connected which of course is another way of saying that um, if one of those measures is having spin up, then necessarily the other will have spin down. And this is to say that the two electrons, X and Y, cannot be freely recombined with respect to their spin properties. These properties cannot vary independently of each other. So that's what we mean by modal connection here. Okay, next slide. And Ismail and Schaffer propose that, generally speaking, we ought to look for explanations for modal connections. And the explanation they propose is what they call an inference to a common ground. So the thought here is that um, the reason why these electrons are modally connected is because each of them is grounded in a further distinct entity, which is in fact the entire entangled system. Now grounding here, um, we, we're not gonna talk a great deal about about in this paper, but the basic idea is that it's a world relation, it underlies metaphysical explanations, and crucially for our purposes, there's two things to mention. The first is that it's asymmetrical, or it's in this, um, Isbell and Schaffer assume it to be asymmetrical, and the second is that it goes from the, it takes us from the more fundamental to the relatively less fundamental. So this is the basic idea that they propose. They, they observe this bold connection and they propose a specific explanation. Okay, next slide. So the important point here is that um, according to this version of monism, the entangled system is ontologically and explanatorily prior to its parts. Now, 
we're going to accept for the purposes of this paper that it's a, generally speaking, it's a good idea to try to explain modal connections. And we're not saying that the explanation they propose can't work or is wrong, but what we want to do is to explore an alternative way of explaining. And the thought here is that the modal connection is ultimately sourced in the essences of the entangled particles rather than in the entire um, system taken to be prior to the particles. Okay, next slide. So we're tapping in here to a well-known trend in metaphysics in the last um, 25 years or so of explaining metaphysical necessity by appealing to the essences of certain entities. And in particular, we're going to appeal to the general essence. And by essence here, we should, I, should, I should add, we have in mind a non-modal conception of essence which is closely tied to the idea of a real definition of saying what a certain entity is, metaphysically speaking, or what it is for that entity to exist. So the thought, when we speak of general essence here, we mean something like what it is for something to be an electron, as opposed to being a particle of some other kind, or as opposed to being a non-particle altogether. So, and, and of course, this notion of general essence can be distinguished from the question of what is essential to any one electron as opposed to any other electrons. So this is our idea. We're going to say that the modal connections need to be explained. We're going to explain them by appeal to the, the essences of the, of, the, of the particles. Now, before we get to our proposal, we want to briefly consider another proposal, which we call the straightforward proposal. And this is laid out in the slide. X and Y are modally connected with respect to a property F. And this is explained by it is collectively essential to X and Y together that if one of them has a certain um, status with regard to property F, the other must have a different status with regard to property F. That's the, that's what, that's the straightforward proposal. Okay, next slide. So this proposal at least it chimes with some of the things that, um, that Matteo and Claudia Colosi um, talk about in their paper. And so they put forward a, a conception of the relation between entangled particles, which um, they I think they term it mutual essential dependence. So the idea is we have X and Y, X is essentially such that EX entails EY, and Y is essentially such that EY entails EX. So the notion of EX and EY here is meant to incorporate not just the existence of X and Y, but also their having certain properties. You might say it's a kind of a thick notion of, of X and Y. Um, so X is existing and being a certain way, it, is essentially, it, it, it essentially requires Y to exist and be a certain way and vice versa. And the straightforward proposal then is that we explain the modal connection by appealing to this mutual essential dependence. So that's the straightforward proposal in, in a nutshell. And you can see that it's a very straightforward application of the general approach of trying to explain um, metaphysical modality by appeal to essences. Okay, now a worry with this proposal is, is the following. The modal connection between X and Y is rigid. That is to say X, if it's modally connected with Y, it is modally connected with that specific electron, let's say, if, they're, if we're talking about electrons and no other. I say, or I say I know other, of course, I'm, I'm assuming here the Choi example of, of two electrons. Um, of course, it could be, mo in theory, it could be modally connected to a number of electrons. But in each case, it's connected to those specific electrons and not any other. So we, that's, why, that's why we have a rigid modal connection here rather than some sort of generic modal connection. And the other thing to know is that this rigid modal connection only holds once these electrons are entangled with, with each other. Okay, next slide. So the thought here is that, um, and, and, and Colossi and Morganti correctly note this, that their, their proposal doesn't require that the two particles are mutually dependent in general because the two particles may exist unentangled, rather they become symmetrically dependent on each other. But this then raises a, a peculiar thought that that uh, mutual essential dependence in this case is a conditional essential connection. It's an essential connection which only holds given a certain condition. And this very much goes against the usual way of understanding um, um, essential truths and, and essential dependence. And furthermore, um, it, it's at least 
strongly implied by what they say that this this essential connection is not just contingent it's it is not just conditional it is contingent and this goes even more strongly against um, the, the, the usual way that essential dependence is understood so we want to back up a bit we want to keep the, the general idea of explaining the modal connection by appeal to essence but we don't think it can be done in this straightforward way okay next slide okay so now we come to our proposal um, first of all, we introduce the, the, the very basic idea. The thought here, and we're just again talking about electrons. Each electron is essentially such that should a certain condition be met, that electron will become modally connected with respect to some of its properties with another electron or electrons. So the crucial thing there is that in, in a sense, that there's, there's been a scope shift. We've, we've moved the essentially so that it's now incorporating the condition. So the idea here, one way to fill out this idea is that each electron has a number of slots. And these slots can be filled by some other electrons. And if that happens, if that condition is met, then those two electrons are locked together into a rigid modal connection. And of course, we, we, in theory, this, this idea of slots leaves open a lot of possibilities in terms of how many electrons can go into the slots. The slots may, um, might be sensitive to different um, properties and so on and so forth but that's the very very basic idea we're working with so next slide so this is the this is what we call essential disposition so x is any electron and condition c is x is being entangled with a certain number of other electrons and the thought here is that any electron x essentially has a certain disposition it has a disposition to become modally connected with respect to some property with an electron or electrons when condition C obtains. Now, sorry, I, sh I, should, I should say straight away, we have, um, we've worked out this idea in terms of dispositions. It's not strictly speaking required that one does so. What's required is that it's worked out in terms of conditional, um, essential truths, which, which concern um, what happens when certain conditions obtain. Um, we've chosen to develop that idea in terms of dispositions, but strictly speaking, that's not required. And there are a couple of other places in the literature where people have, have talked about this, not in very much detail, and they've, they've described it more in terms of, of, of conditions holding. So um, um, Jessica Wilson has a paper criticizing Kid Fine where she talks, where she, where she, where she talks in, in terms like this, for example. Okay, I want to mention quickly four things about essential disposition. First of all, this essential disposition is general, which is to say that it is true of any electron. It does not specify any one electron as opposed to any other. So that's what's meant by it being general. Secondly, what's essential to any electron X on this view is not that it is modally connected with some other electron or electrons. So this, this essential disposition is, is compatible with there being no modal connections between electrons whatsoever. What is essential is that it has a certain disposition to become modally connected. Okay, next slide. Thirdly, this is a generic disposition. So it's not a disposition for any electron X to become connected with any specific other electron. Rather, it is a disposition which is, so to speak, directed at any electron whatsoever. Any electron will do as long as it, as long as it and X join together in the, in the right circumstances. And finally, this disposition is unconditional. So unlike mutual essential dependence, this condition characterizes any electron regardless of what conditions obtain. That's the, that's, the, that's the notion of calling it an essential disposition. And of course, it characterizes these electrons whether or not it manifests in um, this, this sort of mutual um, um, modal connection. So why does, why does this help us? Well, it takes us beyond mutual essential dependence. It avoids the problem that we identified because it doesn't require us to say that it's essential to one electron that it be connected to any other specific electron. And it doesn't require us to say that there are essential relations which are conditional or contingent. Rather, what we're doing is we're taking, we're trying to explain a rigid conditional modal connection between the, the electrons which actually are entangled. We're explaining that in terms of an essential disposition, which is generic. So it's a disposition aimed at any electron whatsoever, and it's unconditional. Each electron has it regardless of what else is going on. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, sorry, I've just, I've just more or less outlined 
the first part of the slide. So condition C, um, this idea is obviously carrying a lot of um, a lot of weight in our view, and we're not going to say a whole lot about it because what we think is that working out this particular condition is is something which we would look to the relevant empirical science to decide. Excuse me. And in the case of electrons, we're talking about and we're talking about entanglement with respect to spin. And in the case of other quantum particles, excuse me. <coughs> We'll be talking about entanglements with respect to other properties, but in theory, we can develop um, ED, essential, depend essential disposition, into a much more general claim. And in theory, there could be different conditions applying to different kinds of entity. So, uh, next slide. So, this gives us generalized essential disposition. And the thought here is that in principle, this notion of an essential disposition could be applied to any number of entities of different kinds. And of course, each of them will have a different um, kind of condition C, which is relevant to their becoming modally connected. And um, I mentioned at the bottom of the at the bottom of the slide, quark confinement, that's another example. And um, we but I'm not going to talk about it now because um, but, but um, we, we can talk about it during the questions if necessary. OK, next slide. So Matteo talked about coherentism in his talk. And another phrase that gets used quite a lot in, in discussions of the metaphysics of quantum mechanics is holism. And we called our, our, our talk, our, the title of our talk mentions holism. And we think that our position is holistic in a specific sense. And I, 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 I don't know, I'd be, I, I'm not, I haven't discussed this with Tumas, but I personally wouldn't object if someone was to say that our position was a sort of coherentism as well, although maybe an unusual sort. So, okay, but we're, we're using the language of holism in this in this um, talk. So, it's important to distinguish two kinds of holism. One of them is a very familiar kind. We, we, we're going to call it existential holism. And the thought here is that this is a condition on the existence of entities of a certain kind. So, you might say each individual entity of kind K can only exist in a network of other entities maybe of that kind, or maybe of other kinds. So I think we, we, that's a, that seems to be a quite familiar um, way in which you can think about holism. What we're proposing is something that you might call essential holism, which is a condition on what it is to be a member of a certain kind. So the thought here is that um, what it is to be, for example, an electron, um, the general essence includes other entities. So if one wants to, if one wants to state in a, in a long sentence or a proposition, what it is for an entity to count as an electron, one would mention these other entities and these other and these other conditions. Um, so the essence of Ks will include this condition C and the other entities, the, the Ls, um, with which the ent entities of this kind are disposed to become modally connected. And an interesting point to note here is that um, just just thinking in terms of in terms of, of, of general um, essential dispositions. Um, the kind of holism we have in mind does not require that the entities included in the essence of a K actually exist. And this, I think, is a familiar point from disposition. So it's familiar that you can, you know, to take a toy example, take the toy example of solubility. It seems that to say what it is for um, the property of solubility to be instantiated, to, to, say, to give its real definition, one would mention liquids, for example, or maybe perhaps liquids of a certain kind, of a specific sort of solubility. But it seems possible for an entity to instantiate that property in a universe without liquids. So there's, there's an essential, um, um, and I, 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 I don't want to use the word relation here, but liquids feature in the essence of the property solubility, but it does not require that liquids must actually be present in the universe where the property of solubility is instantiated. Now, of course, that's just a toy example, and, and um, applying that example to, to, to actual properties in quantum mechanics would be a lot more complicated. But that's the basic idea that we're driving at when we're distinguishing existential holism from essential holism. Next slide. And our position um, can be thought of as, as holistic in, in the essential case. Each, in, each um, electron, for example, is by its nature apt to or indeed inclined to enter into relations, specific combinations with other, other entities. So one might say that they, these entities are holistically inclined. 
Uh, the second part of the slide is, is rather more speculative. It's, it's, it's noting that, that in principle, the kind of general essential disposition we've outlined, in principle, it could range very widely. It could apply to any, um, any category of entities might have some dispositions of this kind. And in theory, they could be inclined to enter into modal connections with any other entities of any other kind. Now, of course, that's just a claim in principle. And what we would need to do is to work out, um, is to coordinate that with, with actual um, scientific research, because of course, it might turn out that certain combinations are just not going to be possible. So maybe it's just not possible for, let's say, an electron to become modally connected with um, you know, an entity of, of, of a radically different sort. But what we're saying is that the, the, our position leaves open that possibility. Uh, next slide. Okay, and that's it from me. So thank you very much. I'm now going to hand you over to Tumas to take it home. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I'll uh, be fairly brief. So now Donak has outlined uh, the basic account and uh, the, the rest of the talk is pretty much just uh, uh, comparing our account to this competing account of Ismos and, and Schaffer's that we, we started out with. So um, it's an alternative explanation, um, alternative uh, ho holistic explanation, if you like, but it, uh, is it better? Well, we think that there are some aspects in which uh, it is better, or at least uh, equally good, uh, if, uh, if not better. And uh, the most important of these is uh, that I think our approach is uh, uh, more neutral or more flexible than this motion Schaffer's. So um, Mate also talked about this a little bit, but uh, our approach does leave open the possibility of metaphysical foundationalism or the idea that some particles are metaphysically fundamental. So uh, they wouldn't be dependent uh, on a, a anything else. Um, now, this contrasts with Isman and Schaffer, who of course think that there is one fundamental thing, but it's just the cosmos as a whole, this type of priority monism. Now, we think that this is an advantage because uh, we take it that uh, the, the jury is still out there on which interpretation of quantum mechanics is the correct one. So we are interested in outlining uh, ontological options for a number of these approaches. Uh, one of them, of course, is, is Bohmian mechanics, which would presumably be a type of pluralist ontology where there are some fundamental uh, particles, fundamental entities. So a type of metaphysical fundamentalism would hold there. I've got a quote there from, from Goldstein, Shelley Goldstein, on, on, on the Bohmian mechanics. Uh, so that's one advantage. Um, and we can, we can develop this a, a little further. Here we can, we can uh, appeal to Claudia Colossus, uh, interesting work on this, and also uh, Dorato's, um, where Colossi has argued that uh, monism, priority monism of the Ismail Shapur type, that is, doesn't fit well with a number of other well-known interpretations. Uh, so, for instance, modal interpretations in, a co in, a, in addition to, to Bohmian mechanics. Uh, or it doesn't fit very comfortably with Robelli's relational theorem either, as Dorata has, has pointed out. So, uh, so the Ismail and Schaffer approach is, is not very flexible at all. Um, while it would be a bit quick to conclude that our position is the best metaphysical kind of theorem under any of these interpretations, it is certainly undeniable that it is uh, a little bit more neutral and it is better compatible with at least some of these uh, options, such as there being uh, a pluralist uh, multiple uh, account of fundamental entities. Okay, so um, if entangled particles are among the fundamental entities, then our position would be a more plausible metaphysical model, we argue, uh, for these interpretations. Okay. Now, another point which uh, we think compares our account in favor of the two Ismail and Shaffers is that uh, we can be neutral about individuality. Now, this is something that Mathieu also talked about, so I can be fairly brief here. Basically, there are at least uh, three fairly well-known accounts of individuality or non-individuality in, uh, in, in quantum mechanics for entangled particles. Um, one of them is, is that uh, an individual could be absolutely discernible from all other entities. Uh, one of them is uh, well known from Saunders' work that individuals only need to be weakly discernible. And on a third view, view which we quite like, um, uh, E.J. Lowe's, an entity is an individual if there is a fact of the matter as to which entity of its kind it is. And entities fail to be individuals if there's no fact of the matter as to uh, which is which. 
Now, so importantly, uh, we don't want to commit to any of these accounts. But again, uh, the point is that we don't have to make a commitment on our account. Uh, we can be neutral about this question of, of, of individuality. So we suggest quite generally that it's a, it's desirable of, uh, of metaphysical theory of, of quantum entanglement to remain neutral about whether uh, quantum particles are individuals or not on any of these understandings of, of individuality, at least these three. Uh, there are specific problems, uh, I should say, though, with the weekly discernible uh, account. We can go into those in more detail in, in Q&A if you like. So uh, we talk about general essences of particles, and that doesn't require any entities uh, uh, that the entities which share this essence to be to be individuals in any specific sense. Uh, so we can account, uh, we can apply this account to uh, to any of these uh, these different options. Uh, that's just a, an example of how you could do it with with Lowe's sense of individuality at the bottom of the slide. But I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll push on. So these were two advantages, but there's one aspect which uh, Ismail and Schaffer, um go into some detail about, which we'd like to, to talk about a little bit. And this is the uh, commitment that Ismail and Schaffer make to, to Hume's uh, inference. So Hume's inference is, is uh, on the, on the top of the slide there, very simply, uh, if entities X and Y are necessarily connected, modally connected, as we've suggested, then X and Y are not distinct existences. Now, there's a little bit of interpretation to be done about here, specifically, what does it mean to be distinct existences? And uh, the notion of entities being distinct from each other in this context, that Ismail and Schaffer appeal to, uh, doesn't mean that they're simply numerically distinct. Uh, instead, they give uh, a sort of a metaphysical reading of, of this uh, uh, idea of being wholly uh, distinct. Uh, so we have it here. Uh, the notion of uh, Ismail and Schaffer's uh, notion of being, as we put it, uh, wholly distinct would be that entity and X and, and entity and Y are wholly distinct if X and Y are neither identical nor connected by grounding. So neither grounds the other, nor do they have a common ground following on their common ground uh, proposal. So in this reading, if, uh, if X and Y were to be modally connected, then either X is identical with Y, or one grounds the other, or they have a, a common ground. Now, this is a problem uh, for us if you accept Hume's inference, because obviously we've suggested that there is a modal connection here. So um, if, if you have an electron X and an electron Y, say, and they are entangled, and so modally connected with each other, then they can't be wholly distinct it seems, if you accept uh, the uh, Hume's inference uh, account. Uh, and nor can they be identical, because uh, either x grounds y or y grounds x, or they have a common ground. Now, any of these options would threaten to make our account, and, uh, our account redundant, because there's an alternative account of, um, of the model connection between x and y here. However, this problem, of course, is very much tied to Hume's inference. And as, as Matteo already pointed out, it's, it's, a, it's not a surprise that uh, we might want to, to deny it. Uh, indeed, this uh, connects to the issue of free recombinability. So what reason is there to accept Hume's inference? And what reason is there to accept this proposed definition of wholly distinct entities, which is a very specific account that Islam and Schaffer give? Well, we think that there aren't particularly good reasons to accept either. Uh, being wholly distinct, it's a term of art here, rather than a term with a fixed prior meaning. And on our account, it, it uh, turns out to be different. So it's open to us to suggest, suggest that X and Y might fail to be wholly distinct if, for instance, they are essentially connected precisely in the lines that, that we proposed in section two, uh, the, this idea of MED, mutual essential dependence. So being essentially connected in this way wouldn't uh, on our account entail that X and Y are connected by grounding. So we would, we would deny this idea of being wholly distinct or the metaphysical reading of being wholly distinct in terms of common ground that Ismail and Schaffer give. So that's one uh, way to, to uh, get out of this uh, problem. Uh, but we also want to question Hume's inference on independent grounds. Uh, so the suggestion that modally connected entities can't be wholly distinct. Um, if we, if we take Hume's inference, then if electron X and Y are entangled, they can't be wholly distinct. They must be connected by grounding, or perhaps on our account, be essentially connected, or meet some other condition, uh, which you think is sufficient for entities to not be wholly distinct. 
So the question is, why should should you accept that? And uh, there's two reasons to, to doubt this. First is that it's hard to see how you could accept Hume's inference without first clarifying the relevant notion of being wholly distinct, which was just a question. And uh, the second is that we've offered now a different metaphysical account of modal connections. And this is just a competing account to this uh, the commitment to Hume's inference, if you like. So X is essentially disposed to become modally connected in certain circumstances, C with other entities, when X is in these sorts of circumstances, with Y, X, and so on. So on our so account, there's no reason- Five minutes now, Thomas. Yeah, no problem, I'll, I'll wrap up. So on our account, no reason to think that X and Y couldn't be wholly distinct or on a, on a given understanding of, of this uh, notion of being wholly distinct. Good, yeah, I'm wrapping up uh, well in time here. So we can conclude now that um, there's a competing account, our account, Jusmans and Schaffer's, uh, which argues that the best explanation for why entire particles are more connected is that they share a common ground. Now that is one way to go, but we've argued now, presented that there's another uh, explanation which uh, they don't consider, which is that model connections can be explained by appeal to the essence of the entangled uh, particles. And we've seen that uh, this gets out uh, from from some uh, uh, some problems that we've presented. So we've we've presented this account as Donica pointed out by appealing to essential dispositions, but uh, it could in principle be developed in a different way. Uh, so this uh, appeal to dispositions is is optional. And uh, it seems that our account, because of its uh, relative neutrality, does compare favorably with, uh, or at least does as well as this common ground account uh, on a number of, of criteria, among other, others that we can apply it uh, more liberally to different implementations of quantum mechanics. And uh, that's it. Uh, here are a few references. Um, we have a full draft of the paper, by the way. So if, if someone is interested, we can, we can share that draft, I think, as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. We have plenty of time for discussion now. Uh, so the first question is Desius. Please, Desius. Well, thank you. Very nice talk. Very interesting. I would like to thank you both for the very kind presentation. I would I like to 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 make some comments just in, in, in a, a, a specific point obviously when you spoke about identity and individuality you spoke about the human inference which is quite interesting and i love this so much the idea of the the participation of the, the idea that entangled things are connected in a strong sense but uh, as I try to emphasize in my talk, I think it's necessary to specify the mathematical structure or the mathematical formalism you are using to, uh, to give account to your feelings. Because in, in using the, the, the human uh, in, uh, inference, you said that entangled electrons are not wholly distinct at all. This is a nice idea, but it depends on the metamathematics. Because where you are expressing disentangled systems, if you are using standard mathematics, you are committed to identity in a very strong sense. You will express the entangled system as a vectoring, so to say, in a Hubert space. And then you are working about which sets. Then the letters are wholly distinct because they are necessarily classical entities. Then if you can express, if you wish to express, that uh, things like electrons can be entangled without being wholly distinct, you need another mathematics, not classical one. And you mentioned also Miller, uh, Miller and Saunders' papers, a very well-known paper, where they say that uh, quantum particles need just to be weakly discerned. Again, this is a mistake there in their paper because they explicitly use zermelo Franco with textual choice set theory. Then the, the particles, whatever they are, it's independent of what if they are particles in the Bohmian sense or excitations and so on, they become, strictly speaking, discernible things in a strong sense because they become sets in the representations. 
uh, Saunders didn't like it so much this idea because there is a flaw in her that paper, but the Miller accepted that immediately because he understood the idea. I would like to know about uh, what do you think about this this kind of reservation uh, with to, to to the meta mathematics you are using because you don't mention anything about. Thank you for thank you both for the kind presentation, very nice presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for for these uh, these uh, uh, remarks. I I let Donna in if he wants to, um, but I, I can say one thing to begin with. I mean, firstly. I, I mean, I think we, we are very much sympathetic to what, you, what you're saying. Uh, we haven't developed uh, uh, the, the details of the account, but uh, you're quite right that they would have to, uh, you know, this notion of being wholly distinct would have to be specified. And uh, if what you're saying is right, then there's, there's probably a lot of work to be done there. Now, I mean, I'm very much sympathetic to what you say about Saunders as well. Um, in particular, I mean, this is, um, I discussed this with Stephen French when I gave a version of this talk early on in, in Leeds, and he made a very similar uh, similar remark about this. Um, now, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what, what my colleague James says about this in a, in a nice paper on, uh, on 2015. Uh, I think I've got the reference in, in our paper here. Are there individuals in physics? And if so, so what? And he makes a very, very valid point, I think, that uh, this, this um, distinction between absolute and weakly discernible may not be uh, a good way to, to think about individuality in physics physics at all. Now, that does leave open what, what is the good way to, to think about individuality, but I, I will leave you, who are much better equipped to answer that question, to, to address this issue. <laughs> but thanks very much. So, thank you. Now, thank you so much, Thomas. Have you No, I don't, I don't, I don't. You're muted. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Otavio, your phone right. is working. Yeah, well, uh, thank you uh, both, uh, Donag and uh, Thomas, for the great talk. I really, really like the project. So I'd like to press on the issue of dispositionalism, right? Uh, I know that uh, you, real, you highlighted that um, you're framing it in terms of dispositions, but that's just for convenience. What matters are the conditions uh, that they, they need to be satisfied. Um, uh, but still, you have on the background the essentialism, which does quite a bit of work. Um, then the work is the following. Um, do you think it's a legitimate question to ask? Um, okay, uh, electrons behave the way they do because given certain conditions, uh, they are bound to entering those relations. Uh, and that's because that's the kind of object or the kind of thing that they are. Um, and, and then someone said, all right, and uh, why? Right? Uh, why is that uh, supposed to answer the question uh, that we started from? We were trying to figure out why those modal relations are there. Uh, isn't it uh, a sort of a more um, transparent uh, response to just be clear, say, look, we need some modality in the background. Uh, and of course, we cannot explain everything. Certain things have to be assumed to hold. Uh, since the modalities are ultimately needed in any case, why not just start from there and say, look, there are those modal relations that these objects enter. Um, now, if you want to say, well, they enter in those modal relations because that's the kind of objects they are, that's fine. But it's not clear to me that that offers any additional explanation to just assuming, look, there are those modal facts and that's what, what we had. So I'd like just to take your, and get your uh, take on this. Thanks. Thanks very much, Otavio. Uh, Donica, do you want to, want to start on this or shall I? Um, do you, well, I can I can go first, Jonas, if you like. Sure. Yeah. So so obviously we're we're working within a certain framework where it's it's just assumed that um, it's it's um, it's reasonable to ask um, for for explanations of of modal connections, and it's. A, a, um, a suitable answer would appeal to the essences of certain entities. And 
of course one could adopt a different approach and in a sense one would then bypass the whole debate certainly but one would bypass the debate because i'm just male and schaefer and possibly a lot of a number of other people as well but i would say that it's in this particular case it seems reasonable to say that these in a clear sense continue they're con in that they are modal, they are really necessary, um, but they only that only kicks in when certain conditions are are instantiated. So it seems more, more reasonable, I think, in that case, to request an explanation. So that's one 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 half. Why does the book stop with the essence of electrons in the way that we understand it? And the thought here would be that. In a sense, if you, if you understand what what, are, what we've if I say what it is to be an electron is blah blah blah, and one understands what I've said, then one will, part of understanding that is to understand that one cannot ask intelligibly for 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 um, an, a further explanation of that. I mean, one can ask real questions. One can ask questions about why ones exist, or um, you know why they maybe manifest in some ways given certain conditions, and maybe one might want to talk about um, um, you know one might want to bring versus laws of nature, but if one accepted the description that was, it seems to me to be quite reasonable for us to then say, look, the buck stops here. There is there is no further explanation possible. And I so I think, and that of course fits very neatly with the overall approach of explaining modalities in terms of essence. And I think, I mean, so ju just very last thing to say, this is just one way of approaching the issue. We're not saying that this is, this is um, a cut and dried case, but I do think we're tapping into a fairly well accepted research program in metaphysics more generally. And I think if one accepts that, I think one would also accept that it's reasonable to, to, um, to stop the line of questioning when you get to the, um, the essential truths and the essential conditions. Thanks, Jonica. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now we got the okay, yeah, answer okay. from uh, a question from M A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that talk. I mean, I think it's a great position. It's what I, I mostly agree with. And I have, I guess, I have sort of a history of philosophy question with it, which is. Um, in the modern period up to recent philosophy, this idea of a disposition which makes a thing what it is, so is essential to it, and explains how it changes in response to other things, seems that this has a tradition of the concept of affect coming from Spinoza. Right, you know, uh, what, is, um, what is the effect of a mode? It's uh, how it changes in response to the world and what encounters it, and it changes its capacity to act or it increases or diminishes its, well, what it can do. So it's modal. Uh, I think you could. I think you could read the modal connection in that pretty quickly if, with a little work. And then, my, so my question with that is: one, uh, do you think that's a fair categorization? Was there maybe any influence with this tradition? And two, it seems to me that when people take up the notion of affect, it's usually alongside a rejection of a categorical account of essence and more of an embrace of a notion of individual essence, like coming from Avicenna. And so if, if so, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or do you have a defense of using this account of modal of, uh, modal S of uh, yeah, sorry, a, a essential disposition, which uh, does not, which preserves categoricity rather than needing some account of how an individual essence changes as its modal properties change through its interactions. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, um, do you want to do you want to get a lead on this, Donica, as well? I, uh, I mean, I I, 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 I have something to say about the first part of the question. Go ahead. So let's we'll say that. Um, so I guess I think you're probably right. That there is historical um, root, and that um, like Spinoza takes this view very, very seriously. So when Spinoza talks about things like causes um nowadays at least some people understand it as meaning something with a lot more medical punch than um the, the notion of cause which which dominated a lot of a lot of philosophy of science in the last so 
and then and then and, and then the thought is that a decisional essentialist approach to causation would have a lot more in common with that idea of um, one thing bringing about another, rather than just there being there happening to be an answer correlation. So I think as a map history of science or uh, history of philosophy, I think I think you're right. I mean, Thomas might have some ideas about whether Spinoza specifically is being cited in this work. I, uh, um, this kind of is, is dispositional essentialism might fall under a very, very broadly speaking in neo Um But of course, that doesn't mean that it's an non-spinozistic approach either so um do you want to take over yeah thanks thanks Marco. i mean yeah i mean i guess it's safe to say that we weren't really uh, sort of inspired or, or or building on on the historical approach when we were uh, outlining this but but i i, I agree with what donic has said that that uh, certainly there's a there's a connection there and what, what you quite like mike is, is probably right i mean the, the only thing to add is that the the, the radically holistic view that we that we sort of outlined, which we didn't commit to, uh, that that sort of uh, reminded at least myself of uh, more of a Leibnizian uh, view uh, of uh, of everything. If you if you think that everything everything has a has a sort of s slot to become um, essentially connected with anything else, then then all of a sudden you end up with with some sort of modat kind of thing where everything reflects everything else. Uh, I mean just to stress that we didn't want to commit to that but i think that there are that, that's another way to sort of draw a historical uh connection here now obviously they didn't have much quantum mechanics going on back then but <laughs> thank you guys but but yeah thanks no thanks, matteo Mike. has a question final yeah, question thank you thank you very much guys it was a great talk and uh, of course as you can expect i agreed pretty much everything you said so uh, three Tiny points, just for clarification mostly. So first point, you claim that you don't need this position. So it's just a, a choice that you made for today. But let me be clear on this. You, you move from a conditional to an unconditional um, essence, uh, essential um, uh, attribution, right? Um, so in this case, it, you seem to be forced to claim that you know this particular particle has the disposition to behave in such and such a way if these particular conditions um, occur. So it, it seems to me that if you want to have an unconditional essence claim, then you need this position. So I would like to hear what's the alternative. Second point about holism. You, you seem to be working with a pretty weak notion of holism because you said basically particles are holistically inclined because you, they can enter into combinations. But in this sense, everything is holistically inclined. I am holistically inclined and can go out there and hug someone. So holism is too cheap in a way. Seems to me that you need something more to, 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 to make a holism claim, which leads me to the third point. Third point being, it seems to me that you have an account of what it is in the particles that leads them to be in an entangled system. You don't have an account of what it means to be an entangled system. So in a, in a way, you need coherentism at that point, I would claim, because you have a nice story, a very nice story, nicer than mine, of course, uh, as to what it is in the particles that leads them into a particular situation. I have an account of what it means to be in that situation. And it seems to me that once you want to have this essentialist attribution, joining particles of the same type, then you naturally end up with claims like, wait a moment, not everything is holistic. Holism means that things have this inclination to get into mutual dependence um, um, settings. You see, you see what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mike. So, will, will, I, will I go first, Thomas, or would you rather go first this time? If, uh, well, let me take let me take one while I remember, and then you can you can add to that, Tonika, if that's okay. Sure. So, uh, I just wanted to say that probably we would sure. agree agree uh, with the, with the fact that that uh, you matter and, and Claudia indeed you've given a you've given an idea of, of what it is to be an entangled system now now uh, 
what I would say only about this is that we, we, we kind of want it to be that way. We want it to be a question of sort of uh, more empirically inclined research to, to figure out which, which things can become connected in this sort of way. An entangled system would be one case in point, and you guys have given a much more precise account of what it is to be that kind of system. So I think that that sounds, that sounds about, uh, about right, and we could, we could, uh, we could give, you, give you that. Um, now, whether or not the, the sort of account on the background, the, the second point you, you touched on, is, is too weak or too cheap of a, ho of a holism, that, that one I'm not sure if I, if I agree with, because it has to be pretty weak to allow for these sort of different kinds of connections. So, so it depends, again, on the empirical details. So if, if we accept the possibility that, uh, in principle, um, uh, you know, motivated by decoherence or something, everything has, has uh, a certain level of entanglement with everything else. Well, then everything is sort of very, 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 very weakly connected to everything else. So there's a very type of weak holism involved there. Uh, but again, empirical details uh, will, will lay out what this means in particular. Um, yeah, uh, on the first point, uh, or any of these others, maybe Donica has something to add. So yeah, just just briefly to add, on the second point, I suppose the, the, the so this is about the the weakness of holism. I agree up to a point, but I would say that it's not simply that entities can enter into combinations with each other or are, are inclined to enter into combinations with each other, but it's the thought that these combinations are of a certain strength. They are they are you know once entered into there's there is there is this um, um, modal necessity. Now that. That, of course, is not unique to entanglement, and Isnell and Schaffer um, point out that this can happen in other ways as well. But in a sense, that is the target we're after. So, so that's, that's the strength of holism that we, we consider appropriate. Uh, it's not nothing, but of course, it's, it's certainly not. I mean, you know, we could maybe call this weak holism or something to signal the fact that it's, it's certainly weaker than other theories which have been called holistic. On the dispositional point, well, I mentioned that, that some other people in the talked a little bit about, um, you know, it, it is essentially true of such and such an entity that, and, they, and then a conditional statement follows. Jessica Wilson mentions this, and Jennifer Wang mentions it as well in a very nice paper on the, the um, um, essences of fundamental entities. And they, they don't, neither of those, I think, really develop this in, in, in any detail. And the reason we went for this position because they well know metaphysical account of um, certain conditional claims. And, but I suppose the what we're talking is that it might be the possibility that there are other ways of understanding the metaphysics underlying um, certain conditional structures or conditional claims. And in particular, one might think that dispositions are as, as they're usually understood in metaphysics, are tied very much to causation. And maybe one might want to say that, no, there's a, what's really going on here is not causal. It's not disposition, strictly speaking. It's something like, and then they about, you know, some sort of conditional property or something like that, which is, non strictly speaking, non-dispositional. And I think what we were doing is really just leaving room for that kind of response. But we were helping ourselves to notion of position because it's a familiar one and because, of course, they've done it already. So that's a kind of response I would make while acknowledging that I think you've, you've put your finger on something um, um, quite important in that first question. So thanks very much.